Okay, children, it's test time. <laughs> what have we talked about so far? About a pencil, yes. Yes. Excellent, excellent. Without the hand holding the pencil, the pencil is useless. Um, yes, good job. We can give you. <laughs> um, who wants to go next? What would be second? Yes, a, a girl. Yeah. Either one of you. Yeah. Sure. God sharpens us. Like he, uh, like a, like we sharpen a pencil, so that he can get glory. Very good. Yes, good job. The children are paying attention. Um, and what about third? Who wants to go third? Yes, you had your hand up too. If you don't listen to your conscience, you'll be shipwrecked. And that was pictured through the eraser, or the rubber that's at the back of the pencil. Very good. Good job, girls and boys. I tell you that uh, Jesus said in Matthew eleven. Verse 25, that, let's turn there. Maybe we'll begin there. Matthew 11, verse 25. It's very rare that you see that Jesus said, I praise you, Father. So it's interesting. I don't know. I think there's one other time that I can think of, maybe. Um, but here's one. Matthew 11, verse 25. Jesus said, I praise you that, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants, to babies. And um, I think there will be, there could be some of us here, adults, who will miss it. And the children will get it. It would be sad, but there's a reason for that. God is looking for those who have the attitude of a baby, of an infant, God will hide these things from the wise and intelligent and reveal them to infants. So if the children get it, we have hope uh, if we become like children as well. Okay, another thing I'd like to tell you from the example of the pencil is that it's not what the pencil looks like on the outside, but what's on the inside. Because the pencil you could have, this one happens to be black and yellow. It could be red, it could be green, it could be scarred, it could be scuffed, it could have a hole here. Uh, it could be perfectly round, it could have ridges. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is the inside. Most pencils are made out of wood, or some kind of wood on the outside. And in the center is what's called graphite. It's a particular substance with which you can write. And it's not as much what the outside looks like as what's on the inside. That's the lesson that I'd like you to think about. It's not the graphite exterior, but the but the it's not the wooden exterior, but the graphite in, interior. Let's turn to Luke, chapter seventeen. Jesus said about the kingdom of heaven. See, when Jesus came to earth at that time, God's people were part of the kingdom of Israel. I mean, there were two kingdoms: the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah, and. Um, the Jews at that time thought that God, having brought them back from captivity in Babylon into back to Israel, that now they were going to become get the kingdom back because they were under the authority of the Romans. They were oppressed by them. The Romans had conquered them. And they thought the Messiah, the, all the students of the law, thought that the Messiah was going to come back and restore the kingdom to Israel. They're going to overthrow the Romans and bring back bring back the uh, the Jews into power. That's why the Pharisees were confused. And I think even Judas Iscariot was confused. Even the disciples at one point, is this when you're going to restore the kingdom? And Jesus said, <laughs> it's like he was saying, you, you, you've been with me so long and it's not been about the kingdom of Israel anymore. It's been about the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said here in Luke 17, verse 21, Luke 17, verse 21, uh, and here he responds. Let's read verse 20 first of all. Having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, and they were looking for a physical sign, 
that somehow uh, Caesar would be overthrown or something else would happen, there would be a revolution. They were looking for a sign. He answered them and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. The kingdom of God is in your midst. It's inside you, the literal word there. The kingdom of God is inside you. What is a kingdom? The kingdom is basically an area where the king has complete authority, complete authority. And it's easier for God to come and establish a kingdom, say here in the United Kingdom, let's say. You know, it would be easier for God to come and become the king of this country, not the king of my heart. And that's what the Pharisees wanted, ultimately. We'd love for you to be the king of this earth, but let me think whatever I want, and let me have an attitude according to whatever I want. Let me have motives. That's on the inside. And it's very easy for us as Christians now in the New Covenant to fall into that trap of letting God be the king of our outsides, like I pray before I eat, I pray before I take an, uh, a test, if I'm going on a long journey, we pray. It can sound religious, but those are outward things. Are you willing to let God be the king of your motives, your attitudes, your thoughts, those things that nobody else can see? Then the kingdom of God, you're experiencing the kingdom of God because the kingdom is on the inside where nobody else can see. The kingdom of God is within you. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if we turn there, what this looks like on the outside, so the inside is the precious thing. That is this graphite that I was talking about in this pencil. The outside, what does that look like? Second Corinthians, we read in verse 4, the kingdom of God, this treasure, we have this treasure inside earthen vessels. An earthen vessel is really a way of saying it's an ordinary looking vessel. There's nothing impressive about it. And today in Christendom, we have a lot of Christians and churches that are focusing on making sure the pencil looks fantastic. What I mean by that is that the church meetings must be good music and good preaching and good children's ministry and outreach, evangelism, all this stuff on the outside, making sure that they've got great, nice church buildings and stained glass and a cross and uh, all kinds of facilities. That's just making sure the pencil is really, 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 really good on the outside. But there's no graphite on the inside, or it's not working. There's no power on the inside. It's much better that you have a pencil that maybe looks scratched up and uh, the paint is all chipped, but the graphite is good. And that's what Jesus was saying here, is, and the Holy Spirit is saying here in 2 Corinthians 4, you have this treasure in an earthen vessel, and God's way is such that he's allowed the vessel to look ordinary. He's allowed the vessel to look so plain and so unimpressive and unattractive to see who's really after the inside. What does that mean? See, I think Jesus could have come as a king. He could have come as a king with the life of God still inside him, the divine nature. It didn't matter what you put it in, right? You could put the divine nature in a king, in a servant, in a man or a woman, it doesn't matter. Jesus could have come as a king, an actual earthly king, with the divine nature. But the problem is then it's likely that the Pharisees might have actually followed him. Because, oh, he's the king. Yeah, he's going to be the king of Israel. Let me follow him. But you put the divine nature in a little boy from Nazareth, which if you lived in Israel at that time, you'd say, no way, not Nazareth. Jerusalem, maybe. Bethlehem, perhaps, because the prophets say so. But Nazareth? What good can come out of Nazareth? You put the divine nature in that and let him grow up as a little boy who, when he runs out and plays football like his friends, he also skins his knee and has some blood on it and he has to put a Band-Aid on it. Or he, you know, do you believe Jesus had sickness? I believe he did. He bore our sicknesses, it says in Isaiah 53, the literal translation. So he could have gotten sick as a boy. Sickness is not an indication of sin. Sometimes it is. But in Jesus' case, if he was sick, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be have, because of sin. He never sinned. But this ordinary looking boy who sat in the fourth standard class 
and in class seven and class 10 and whatever they did. And an 18 year old had to make tables and he, he didn't, the same Jesus who spoke into the darkness and said, let there be light, couldn't speak to the wood and say, be a table. He had to actually make it as a table. And the Pharisees were like, no, this can't be God. This cannot be the kingdom of God. It's too ordinary looking. And today the church is hidden in an earthen vessel. The life of God is hidden in ordinary circumstances. Most of Christendom thinks that to be, to be useful to God, you have to go to seminary, go out into the mission field, uh, become a full-time worker, work for a church and all these things, have a big ministry. And Jesus is looking for those who are taken up with the inside. The graphite, the power of God, the kingdom of God within us. It's hidden in an earth, earthen vessel. Um, there's a verse in Proverbs chapter 21 I'd like us to look at together. What is God looking for when he assesses one day all of these pencils will be lined up as it were? What will he do? Will he commend the pencils for how shiny the outside was and um, what colors they were or anything like that? No. Proverbs chapter 21, when God looks around at the face of this earth and sees all the different pencils that are there, he will say, is look at 21 verse 2, Proverbs 21 verse 2, every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the motives. The Lord weighs the motives. Remember, God judges the motives. Proverbs 21 verse 2. It's a very important verse. I hope you write it down. And remember it. What is God going to judge? What is God judging right now? He's not judging that you're sitting here, you're part of this church, or that you read your Bible or anything like that. Yes, that's good. Those are all good things. But what he's looking at is the motive. What's inside? What's inside your heart that nobody else can see? And Christians, unfortunately, are very good at making good appearances, looking like I'm spiritual, talking like I'm spiritual. But inside, there are full of dead men's bones. And that's why this verse is so important to remember. God judges the motive. You know, when you think about what, um, what gives something authority, what gives something power, um, you know this verse in Matthew 7, let me show it to you very quickly, Matthew chapter 7. After Jesus talked about the new covenant, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, at the end of it, this last verse of Matthew 7 is very significant. A lot of people don't think about that when they think about the Sermon on the Mount. But it's sort of the, um, there's a lot of power packed into this verse. Matthew 7 verse 28, it says that after Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. So these people, these multitudes had listened to the scribes preaching from the same Bible that Jesus had. And even the g little Ill illiterate, uneducated fishermen and other poor carpenters and all that sitting there watch the scribe and they're like, he's fooling us. He's a hypocrite. You can see right through him. And then Jesus came and he spoke and there's like, man, this guy's got authority. The scribes don't have authority. This man has authority. What was it about Jesus that even the multitudes, now they may not have followed him, but they recognized he has authority. What was it? What was it that gave Jesus' words authority? And I tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, I have longed for this. I say, Lord, whenever I get up to preach, I don't care whether people like what I say or don't like what I say. Uh, most importantly, I want you to back up my words with your authority. And, and it's not by how I speak. It's not emotion or banging my fist or running up and down the stage or anything like that. It is quietly when I need to be, um, but speaking with authority. Most of you have listened to my dad speak, and he speaks nothing like me. <laughs> yeah, he's more calm and quieter. My temperament is different, that's all. I'm not trying to preach like him necessarily in that sense, but there's authority. He doesn't have to raise his voice. He could speak very calmly, but you recognize there's a quiet authority and i've rarely heard a handful of preachers like that where you listen to them and you recognize the authority of god is in it i've listened to plenty of preachers plenty of preachers so often in my free time driving in the car i'll put on some sermon 
uh, just to see what's out there sometimes. And I'll tell you, I can recognize, I'm not saying this is like a good thing. I've learned that there's a difference between a preacher who has authority and one who doesn't. And I hope that as you start to listen to people and preaching, that you'll also be able to discern that and say, man, no, I don't sense that this has authority behind it. Now, he may be a God-fearing person and all that, but recognize the authority. Even the multitudes could recognize it about Jesus. And I long for that in my preaching more than anything else. I don't seek to be popular. I don't care how many followers I have, whether people like what I preach or not. I say, Lord, you must back up my words with authority. Then it will result in life in others. Because that's all I want. That anything I say will, will inspire others to experience the life of Jesus in them. To have authority. Now, how does... You, know, you think about authority. How did Jesus have this authority? See, Jesus started his ministry, his public ministry, after 30 years of not preaching at all, not performing one min, uh, miracle, not raising one person from the dead, even though there were opportunities to do so before that. A lot of Christians are taken up with uh, healing um, prophecies, healing uh, miracles, raising from the dead, tongues, all of these things. This is all the outward. And Jesus, you know, Jesus never spoke in tongues, first of all. He didn't need to. Jesus never did a miracle for the first 30 years of his life. Um, he didn't preach a single sermon for the first 30 years of his life. For 30 years, it was just as it were the graphite in the inside. What the outside was actually like was just a normal human being. But on the inside was this graphite. And he was showing us 30 years of faithfully never once sinning in his entire life. And that's what gave him that authority. His father, who had watched him in secret, could say, if you go back to chapter 3, a few days maybe before this Sermon on the Mount, a few months probably, you see in Matthew chapter 3, at the end of Jesus' 30 years of private life, you can say, he takes baptism. And after being baptized in verse 16, Matthew 3, verse 16, Jesus, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were opened and John saw, John the Baptist saw the spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him and out, a voice out of heaven said, this was the father saying, before we read what he said, remember, all that Jesus had done at this point was live faithfully in secret. Not a single ministry, not a single sermon, not a single outward, no outward ministry at all. And the father says, I am pleased with this. Think of it like um, a, a, a pencil that is just graphite, as it were. No ministry yet on the outside, just the graphite. But it's pure graphite. And it's strong and it's clear and it's sharp. It's been sharpened. And, it's, and, and God is looking at that and says, it doesn't matter that there's no ministry yet. I am pleased. And God is looking for others who are taken up with pleasing Him more than doing something for Him. I remember some years ago, this I faced this question, John chapter 6. So you turn there with me, John chapter 6. As you're turning there, you know, if you look at, um, we all have, all, all countries have currency notes, right? You have pound notes here. Um, and because those things have value, people make a business out of counterfeiting them, making fake currency. And so there's plenty of fake pound notes, and usually not one pound notes. There's no point wasting money and counterfeiting a one pound note. But if it's a hundred pound note or 500 pound note or whatever, if it's a large amount of currency, people will spend a lot of time in uh, counterfeiting, making a fake hundred pound note or 500 pound note. And ultimately, you could make a, a, a note look exactly like the original. You know, they, they say that there are certain things that are hard to counterfeit, like a watermark or some kind of little bit of a secret thing that's embedded in there that's hard to duplicate, that to make it difficult for counterfeiters. But even if that could be counterfeited, ultimately, what determines the real from the fake? It's who distributed it. Did it come from the government or did it come from your backyard where you have this counterfeiting machine, somebody's backyard? It's who distributed it. That's what makes it original. 
And the government can try to do all kinds of things to protect it from being counterfeited. But ultimately, you know that the, as accurate as a copy as it might be, it's only real if it came from the government of the United Kingdom. And it's just like that with the divine life. What is it that gives our life and our, our words authority is where did it come from? Is your authority based on the fact that, well, let's say, for example, husbands, do you believe that you have authority in your home simply because you are the husband and God has made you the head of the home? Or do you have authority as a father because you are the father? Or has God given you his spiritual authority? This was the longing of my heart many years ago that ultimately led me to move to Colorado and to seek to be under spiritual authority because I saw the truth in God's word that God gives his authority to those who are under spiritual authority. You can read that in Matthew chapter 8 in the story of the centurion. I said, Lord, I want to have spiritual authority. I want to have the authority that you back up my words, that when I try to lead my wife as I should, as the head of the home, it's not me saying, I'm the head of the home, you better listen to me. But quietly and with true spiritual authority, I can speak and she will follow. I can speak to my children and they'll recognize the spiritual authority. Do you long for that, parents? That your children will have will recognize the authority of God in you even before they are born again. These, these multitudes weren't born again, but they recognized the authority that Jesus had. And I say, my children, long before they're born again, long before they receive Christ and repent of their sins, I want them to know daddy has spiritual authority. I knew that when I was, uh, you know, I'll tell you why I was afraid of my dad in a, in a healthy way. Not because he would punish me or discipline me, because I knew that if I rebelled against him, I was rebelling against a man who had authority. I knew that. Long before I was, I knew the things of God. Long before I was, you know, really walking as a disciple. I was like, my dad's got spiritual authority. That I know. And I don't want to mess with that. And that's the kind of authority you want with your children as they grow up. If any of them become rebellious as teenagers or, or even older than that, they, they recognize, yeah, okay, you can rebel. You can't force them to be a certain way. But they recognize that dad has spiritual authority. Mom has spiritual authority. And they, they may never get up and preach, but they have spiritual authority. Do you long for that? Only God can bear witness to it like he did with Jesus. So um, here in John 6, if you had asked me a few years ago, what, what was my calling in life? I would have said my calling in life is to build a church and to be a part of building the church and whether it was in preaching or being an elder in the church or even just a member of the church. I said, I want to build up the church in whatever way God wants me to be. And then I read this passage in John 6, verse 37. You know, in our churches, we're not keen that everybody should join the church because there are some people that shouldn't be in the, in the church. Uh, there are some people that God doesn't want to be a part of the church. He's called them to be somewhere else or um, whatever. And you see what Jesus said. Jesus wasn't looking to get everybody to join his team. He wasn't, there were multitudes that followed him. And whenever the multitudes came, he tended to preach or say something that would offend somebody and they would leave. Now he didn't want them to leave, but he recognized that his calling was very simple. And we'll read that here. And so he says, all, verse 37, John 6 verse 37, all that the father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. So what Jesus was interested when anybody said, hey, I'll follow you. The first question was not the first thought in Jesus' mind wasn't, oh, great. One more follower. I can, our numbers are now up to such and such. That's how most pastors today are. But Jesus' first thought was, father, is this somebody you've given me? Or is it somebody else? If it's not some, if it's not somebody you've given me, I don't want them. And you will give me a word to tell them that will offend them. And they leave. It, it happened time after time after time in the Gospels. Somebody said, let me go bury my father. And Jesus said, let the dead bury, bury their dead. What happened before that? The fa Jesus said, father, is this one you've given me? The father said, no. He loves his father too much. He loves his family too much. So say this, let the bed, dead bury their dead. The man left. Thank God Jesus didn't have to waste time trying to disciple somebody who was more attached to his family than to Jesus, even though outwardly he looked like he was. And so when you look at the Gospels carefully, you see that Jesus wasn't interested in making a bigger church and getting more people to fill the chairs. 
He said, Father, have you given this person to me? If so, anyone who comes to me, I will, I will welcome. All whom the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Why? Verse 38. Because I've not come here to build a church. That's, I've added that word there. I've come here not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And I realized as one who was an elder in the church and one who had a ministry that so often my, I could be taken up with, oh, can I win one more person? Can I get one more person? Can, does this person want to join? I'll invite that person to join the church. Oh, we've got a new family. Oh, this new person came. Somebody else found out about CFC messages. Now they're coming. And it could be so much about let's build a church. Let's build a church. And Jesus had only one ambition. Let me tell you, it wasn't even to save you. Yes, he did save you. But his ambition was to do the will of him who sent him. The will of him who sent him. And he did. And the father's will for him was for him to die on the cross and to save, be the savior of the world. And that's how he was the savior of the world. Not because he set out to be the savior of the world, but because he came down to do the will of him who sent me. I tell you, dear brothers and sisters, this has really set me free in building the church. That I'm not in charge of how many people are members of our church or not. God is. And I leave it completely up to him. And so to me, if somebody gets offended and leaves and stops coming, okay, Lord, we're going to continue to preach the truth, the truth of the new covenant, what's in God's word. And we're going to emphasize that fearlessly and boldly and with authority. And whoever you choose to come to us will come to us. Um, you see earlier, actually before this in John chapter 5, the, the basis of his authority. Matthew chapter, uh, sorry, Matthew cha sorry, John chapter 5. We read in um, verse 26. Matthew 5, it's John 5 verse 26. For just as the Father has life in himself. So how did Jesus as the pencil end up with real graphite inside? That's what we're going to read about. Because we're, th we're thinking about this fact that it's not what the outside of the pencil looks like, but what the inside is. And how did Jesus have that pure graphite on the inside? He says in verse 26, As the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also, to have life in himself. And he gave him authority on the basis of that to execute judgment. So the father had life in himself and he watched Jesus empty himself and say, Father, fill me with your spirit continually. Jesus as a man, even though he was fully God here on this earth, emptied himself and the father could give to the son life. And after 30 years when nobody else saw it, you know that there were people in the same room as Jesus for 30 years who had no idea that he was God. His own brothers, his own brothers, they slept next to him on the floor in their one room house in Nazareth. Next to him. You believe that you could have the life of God in you and the person sleeping next to you, perhaps even your own spouse, has no idea the life of God is in you. That's how secret it is. That's how much of an earthen vessel this is that God has hidden these things. We have these things hidden in an earthen vessel. God wants to hide it to see if you're interested in that, or if you're interested in impressing people. And so, my dear brother, dear sister, if you're in a stage in your life where God is hidden, the divine, the work of conforming you into the image of Jesus so that people around you have no idea. For 30 years, no ministry, no preaching, nothing. Jesus was there living in a home where his own brothers and sisters didn't believe in him. And yet he had never sinned. I mean, could you imagine how blind you have to be that you live with somebody that's never sinned in their whole life and you still think, ah, oh, it's just my brother. <laughs> that's how it was for Jude and James, his brothers. And later on, their eyes were open. So the basis of Jesus' authority was that the father saw for 30 years, I could fill my son Jesus with my life. As I have life, I was able to fill Jesus with my life. And after 30 years, this is a pure graphite pencil, the father says from heaven. This is authority. In Matthew 17, you read, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. He has authority. So if you want authority in your life, if you want authority in your home as a husband and as a father, let it come from the life that God has given you in secret. 
don't seek ministry. I see more and more often even people write to me and saying, what shall I seek for? What should, I want to know what my ministry is. Should I go to Bible school? Should I, uh, should I quit my job and go do this? And I say, no, it's not that. Seek for God to bear witness to God, for God to give you his approval. I thought about this, you know, what is it that Jesus called his disciples with? Um, in, if you turn to Matthew chapter 4, right after the baptism, Jesus goes into the wilderness and then he comes back and he calls a few to follow him, his disciples. But when, when Jesus called his disciples, he didn't, what, you know, if you, if you think about what does Jesus want from you today? What do you think? You know, does Jesus want you to praise him? Does Jesus want you to love him? Does Jesus want you to tell him how awesome he is? Sing to him, pray to him. What does he want you to do? I see a very simple evidence of that in what he told the disciples in Matthew 4 verse 19. He didn't say to them, come and praise me. Come and hang out with me. Come and pray to me. He says, follow me. It's a very, very simple thing. There's only one thing Jesus wants you to do. I believe praise will come. Prayer will come. Worship will come. But it starts with following. And it's very simple. It's very ordinary. It's so ordinary that that it sounds unimpressive. We live in a Christendom today that's taken up with worship. Oh, we had a great worship service. Oh, the praise was so awesome. God was in our midst and Jesus was there and we were praying and the prayer meeting didn't stop and all these things are going on in Christendom. I hope you're not falling for that. And I'm not here to judge anybody, please no. But I'll tell you, it's absolutely clear to me what Jesus expects of you today. He says, okay, you had praising, that's great. You had a long sing song after song after song, hymn after hymn, and you had some time of prayer, a little bit of a message, and you sang some more. That's great. But now it's time to go home and follow me. And I'll tell you, following Jesus doesn't happen here. You can follow him here. But the real test of whether you're actually following Jesus is after you close up the meeting and go home. And that's why I am a big, and I'm probably unpopular for saying this, I'm a big proponent, a big uh, that's a big word. I'm trying to think of the right word for it. I'm a big uh, champion, ambassador of ending the meetings, <laughs> ending the conference at some point, because now I want to know, am I really following Jesus or not? Or I'm just here to hang out with a bunch of people that talk about following Jesus. And I can't wait for the conference to be over. No, I'm, I, I, I'm enjoying be, being with you all. But there's a sense in which, Lord, I want the meeting to be over because you are more precious to me. And I want to make sure with all of my heart that I'm following you, not just talking about following you and hearing about following you. So take me back to that boss. Take me back to my wife and to my children and to my neighbors and to, to, to the local church where I must build integrated fellowship with that brother that's hard to get along with and that sister that, that doesn't know how to, I know, don't know how to interact with. Take me back into those situations and lead me, Lord, and let me follow you. Then, We've understood the inside of the pencil. Otherwise, if you just want more conferences and more meetings, and you want the meeting to go on for hours and then days and then weeks, a, you know, there was a lot of talk going on in, in the United States about meetings that were going on for a long time and they call it revival. I don't know. I'm not here to judge them. But I know this, that Jesus doesn't want, to sit, want you to sit in long, long meetings singing to him. He wants you to go out and follow him in secret where it hurts, where it's going to cost you something. And sit down when the meeting stops and count the cost and say, Lord, would I rather stay here and have this meeting go on forever and ever? Or shall I go down and follow you? This actually happened if you turn over to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17. They had a revival meeting on... A, the top of a mountain, you could say. It was Peter, James, John, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Can you imagine what kind of revival that must have been? Peter, James, John, Moses, and Elijah, and Jesus. And that's when you hear these, these words, this is my beloved son, verse 5. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. He's the one with authority. Moses doesn't have authority. Because Moses, if you went to his private life, you would see him fighting with his wife. As happened, it's recorded in scripture. Jesus didn't quarrel with anybody. Elijah, 
if you if you had the spy camera on him, you'd see him in some corner depressed because God, uh, you know, he's running for his life. He's, he's sitting in depression in a cave somewhere. And then God, a still small voice calls him out. And that's why all, none of these is our example. Moses and Elijah, excellent men as they were, because they were under the old covenant, they're not our example. But Jesus is. And after this revival meeting where, where Peter says, Lord, verse 4, it is good for us to be here. Let's keep the meeting going. Let's, let's, have, uh, let's see if we can get David to come too. Maybe he'll bring his harp and we can sing some and continue the meeting. I imagine that's what Peter might have been thinking. Let's, let's, if you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And then the anger of the father, as it were, comes out and says, don't you dare equate my son with Moses and Elijah. Follow me, Peter. That's the, that's the call I gave you three years ago. Now follow me. And, and, um, and then they, you know, the light, the voice comes, they're afraid. Jesus gets them and, get, uh, it says, get up, verse 7, do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. Moses and Elijah are taken away, and then they come down from the mountain. And um, Jesus tells them to, to, um, to, to not uh, tell the vision to anyone. You know what happens? The very next thing is there's a demon-possessed person that's there. And the disciples couldn't cast him out, and Jesus had to cast him out. So what you see there is that this... this a uh, strong misunderstanding of what revival really is and what the purpose of our meetings really is, is, is a result in people thinking that we are, uh, we are having revival because we have made the pencil look really clean. It used to be all scuffed up and scarred and there was dirt on it and, oh, we're having a wonderful time and nobody's paying attention to the inside. And, oh, that there were more people bold enough to stand and say, Let's call this meeting to an end and let's go home and love our wives and love our husbands and love our children and love our neighbors and help the needy and meet the needs of those around us and be kind and thoughtful and loving in secret and nobody can see us. You know, in, um, in Acts chapter 2, we read about the move of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Let's turn there together. Acts chapter 2. Most people, when you think about Acts chapter 2, you think about what happened on the day of Pentecost and the rushing wind, the sound like a violent rushing wind and uh, which filled the whole house that they were sitting and the tongues of fire that came and that they all spoke in tongues and then the sermon that Peter preached and that 3,000 then had a baptism. Can you imagine how long it took to baptize 3,000 people that day? Um, and then you, but then if you continue reading, you see what, this was the, the, the meeting, as it were. This was the conference. The Holy Spirit came, filled them. There was a prophetic message. There was repentance. There was uh, a stirring. There were baptisms. There were people being born again. There were people answering the call to follow Jesus. And then what? Verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves. Well, let's back up to verse 40. With many other words, Peter solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the, through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. They began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, there's the meeting, and breaking bread, having fellowship from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. And you see, the end result of this meeting was the meeting ended. The Holy Spirit filled them. Souls were saved. Baptisms were, people took baptism. And then they went back and they said, now let's live this out. And you read the rest of the book of Acts and you see, let's, let's see the, the fast forward to the end. The end of this um, record of it, at least. The book of Acts is continuing. 
you can say in a sense that we're in chapter 29. There's only 28 recorded chapters. But look at what it looked like for Paul. You know, here was the mighty apostle Paul, traveled all over the world, time of ministry and um, doing, you know, t establishing churches, appointing elders in every place. And you look at the end of his life. What would you imagine the end of this greatest apostle of all? What did the end of his life look like? You imagine him just like um, while he's in a meeting preaching and all of a sudden the centurion comes and just chops off his head or anything like that. No, it's, it's actually a lot more simpler than that. A lot more ordinary. Verse 30, at the very last two verses of the book of Acts, Paul stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. So Paul, what did he look like? He paid his monthly rent. <laughs> you see that? I like that it records his own rented quarters. He paid his monthly rent. He continued to make the tents that he used to make so that he could earn a living to pay his monthly rent so that he didn't have to be dependent on anyone. And day by day, if anybody wanted to talk to him, he says, yeah, I'm available to talk about it. They had him in prison locked down. And then eventually you read the end of Paul's life. He was beheaded. He was kept in prison and eventually beheaded by Caesar, by Nero. Um, but this is what it looked like. And Jesus made it very clear in his call. He said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, let him take up his cross daily. He didn't say, let them have meetings daily and sing to me and call that worship. Let him take up his cross daily. And you can't do that if you're only having conference meetings for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. Worship. Worship is one of those things that's so misunderstood. Romans chapter 12. What is true worship? Romans 12. Really, um, the, the, the verse begins with the word therefore, which means that we should see what it's talking about, what it is there for. And in verse 36 of the previous chapter, the last verse of the previous chapter, it says that from him, through him, and to him, from God, through the power of God, and to God, that is for his glory, are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. That is our ambition. This is gold, silver, and precious stones. Everything that begins with God, not my own idea, is done through the power of God, not my own strength, and is done for the glory of God, not for me to get any honor out of it. Let me say that again very slowly. How do we know what is really gold, silver, and precious stones? Everything that begins with God. Do you have a desire to build a church? Make sure it's not your desire, but God's. Do you have a desire to gather people in your locality? Make sure it's God's desire before it is yours. It might be yours, but check to make sure that it is God's idea. First, if it begins with you, it will die. If it begins with God, it will last forever. That which begins with God. Secondly, that which is done by the power of God, not by gifts, not by personality, not by money, not by music, not by good preaching or good buildings, but by the power of God. From him and through him and to him. It's done for God to get the glory alone. Not for me to get a name for myself as a preacher or for me to get a name as a pastor or as a musician. All that you see in Christendom. But for God alone to get all the glory. That is gold, silver and precious stones. And he says, okay, you want to live such a life? What does that look like practically? Should we have a conference? Should we have a meeting? Well, he says, okay, you asked. So I'll tell you, therefore... I urge you, because you want gold, silver, and precious stones, you want from God, through God, and to God, I have, here's my command to you. How will you live this life? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. He doesn't say, have a meeting and you sing to me for 10 hours, and then through the night, and then keep coming, nonstop prayer and prayer meetings and conference. At the no, he says, go offer your body as a living sacrifice. Where are you going to do that? We're not doing that here. I tell you, it's no sacrifice for me to be here with you. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> I can tell you where it is a sacrifice for me. Back home in Colorado, where my flesh is tempted in, in interaction with other people on the street when I'm driving. I don't get to drive here, so it's not a temptation for me. But it is when I'm driving there, and the neighbor and the driver cuts me off, and I, I'm irritated inside. God says, from me, through me, to me, offer your body 
as a living sacrifice. Don't use your tongue that way. Don't use your eye that way. Don't use your ear that way to listen to that gossip. Don't use your hands that way. Don't set your mind on the things of this earth that way. Offer your body. And you know, it's one thing to just offer your body. You've heard my dad talk about it. Go piece by piece. Lord, my eyes, I used to use them for myself. They're yours now. My tongue, I used to use it for myself. It's yours now. I'm offering my body cut up piece by piece by piece. My ears, I used to listen to anybody who wanted to come and gossip with me. No, no more, Lord. My ears, they're yours. My mind, what I used to think about, what I spend my time thinking about, whether it's lust or how to make more money or how to further my business or what people think about me, the opinions of people. Lord, I lay that on the altar. My, my body, what I use my money with, what kind of clothes I wear, whether I follow the fashions of this world, all of these things, I cut it up. What I, where I spend my time. Can I go on that vacation or not? Can I buy that thing or not? Lord, I've laid it. I've offered my body as a living sacrifice because this is your spiritual service of worship. That's the literal text there. The, this is your spiritual service of worship. Do you want to worship God? It's not here. And I tell you, not, I don't know of a single church outside of the CFC churches that says that worship is not what happens in the church meeting. Every church and every preacher I've ever heard has always called it worship, is singing. Because that's what it was like under the Old Covenant. But the New Testament is very clear. Worship is you giving your body as a living sacrifice in secret where there's nobody else. I, I've often said this. What is worship? It is God, you, and that which is most precious to you. That's it. You need three things. For worship. God, you, and that which is most precious to you. You see this in Abraham. You know the first time that worship is used? Genesis chapter 22. Abraham had a wonderful walk with God at that time. And then we hear about worship for the first time. The first time the word worship is used in the Bible. Genesis chapter 22. God had already fulfilled the promise that he gave Abraham. I'll give you a son from you and Sarah. Abraham had tried multiple other false leads. He tried Hagar, tried something else and all that. No, finally, Abraham and Sarah. Could you imagine what it was like for Abraham? He's probably had um, Isaac now for about 15 years. I think Isaac's about 15, 17 years old at this point. And he's had 17 years of experiencing the promise of God. And God says, listen, I want to teach you about worship. I want to know that you really love me even more than that promise that I've given you. I want to know that you really fear me more than the promise I've given you. And so he says, I want you to go sacrifice your son. I want you to worship me. I want it to be you, Abraham. I want it to be you, me, and that which is most precious to you. Those three things. So take your son, Isaac, and come, offer him to me. And he takes some servants to help them on the journey. But then he tells the servants, stay here um, in verse 5. Genesis 22, verse 5, the servants that came with him, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and that which is most precious to me will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. I and that which is most precious to me, which was his son, Isaac. I mean, Abraham could have said, Lord, you want a, a hundred oxen? You want a thousand rams? You want 10,000? I'll find them and give them all to you. Just don't ask me to give up Isaac. God says, no, I want you to know what real worship is. You, me, and that which is most precious to you. You know the rest of the story. He came back. Isaac came back, but Abraham experienced worship. And so that's why I don't believe worship is what happens here. Because it's not me and God and that which is most precious to me. Where it is, is me and God and that which is most precious to me is at home. It's in the workplace where nobody else is seeing, where the inside of the pencil is tested. And there's nobody else to impress, but it's just you. That's you and God. That's why Jesus, you know, we don't have altar calls in our church. I don't know if you do it here, but at RLCF, we don't do altar calls because that's it's kind of public. You never hear about those kind of public altars, maybe in the Old Covenant. But you see where Abraham had an altar, God said, climb up to Mount Moriah. Go in secret. Put that which is most precious. And no, you're not there to impress anybody with the by the sacrifice you're making because you're dead serious with God and it hurts too much for you to be seen in public. And that's real, real worship. And I, what we say is if you were inclined, if there was an altar call and you would have come here, 
go home in secret, lock the door, kneel down before your bed, and between you and God, worship him and give that which he asks of you. And make that transaction in secret. It's much better than the impressive people in the, you know, in the front of the pew trying to impress people with their sacrifices. And again, I'm not trying to mock any, please understand, but there's so much of these ideas that have come into Christendom because other people do it. And so you follow that, oh, that church is doing it, so that must be the right way. Let's go back to the Word of God and see how, how is it really? What is real worship? And we see it very clearly. Um, there's a, when, when we really have the power of God, let's turn to this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians four. When it's we, I said at the beginning that the kingdom of God is in us. It's not something on the outside, and here it says it's not in power, not in words. The kingdom of God does not consist in words. That's why even preaching must end at some point, because if all you listened to was some good words, you didn't get the kingdom of God. Yet it could point you to the kingdom of God. All our preaching will not result in you actually experiencing the kingdom of God. It's it, all my examples about the pencil and whatever. It'll just tell you, go home and seek it for yourself. God must give it to you. It's a personal thing. The kingdom of God does not consist of sermons, I would say. Do you pride yourself in how many sermons you listen to? I hope not. Well, it's good to listen to sermons, but don't think that that's somehow making you more holy. Do you pride yourself on the fact that you hear a lot of teaching about the inside of the pencil? But do you actually have it? That's the question. Is that all of that sermon listening doing something inside of you? The kingdom of God does not listen, consist of sermons, but in power. And this power, you know, there's a, a phrase in Hebrews chapter 7 that has long been a, a blessing to me. And I've sought for it. I pray this often. Hebrews chapter 7, it describes the power that Jesus had in his life. Jesus is our high priest, you know that. And there's a priesthood that is symbolized by the priesthood of Levi through Aaron. That was the Le Levitical priesthood. But there's a new priesthood that Jesus has formed, which is not based on, see, if you were a descendant, a direct descendant of Levi, of Aaron, you could be a priest. Direct descendant of Levi, actually. And, but with Jesus, it's not physical descendancy. It is another type of priesthood. How will you know that you're related to Jesus? It, spiritually, how do you know that you're related to Jesus? It's a power. Just like if you tested, you know, if you did a blood test on Eliezer, Aaron's son, blood test comes back, oh yeah, Aaron's son, okay, you can be a priest. Then you go down the line, you know, even Nadab and Abihu, who are later on killed, you did a blood test on them. They can be a priest. Oh, they're ungodly people? Yeah, but they can be a priest. They're, they got the blood of Aaron in them. Descendants of Aaron. So they're priests. They're priests. So what is it now? Is it simply that your sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus? You won't see that. Our priesthood is not based on the fact that our sins are forgiven. It's told. We're told very clearly here. Uh, Hebrews 7 verse um. 15, this is clearer still, if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such, Jesus is a high priest, not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, that is blood test, not on the basis of a blood test, but according to the power of an indestructible life. So how do you know that you are related to Jesus in his priesthood? Do you have the same power in you that Jesus had? Just like for Eliezer, it was the same blood that Aaron had. Now is it the same power? An indestructible life or an unshakable life, some translations say. And I tell you this, some years ago, this became a challenge for me. I says, Lord, I find that in situations I'm shaken. Something happens and I'm shaken a little bit. I'm, uh, you know, get worked up or I'm shaken. I don't want a shakable life. I want a life that's indestructible, that's unshakable, that will prove that I am a descendant of Jesus, that, I, that I'm after his priesthood. I have the same power. Um, uh, in Acts 2, in that same sermon, let's go back there for a second. Acts chapter 2, Peter describes it this way, really, really powerful. 
word. Acts 2 verse 24. God raised him up. Jesus, uh, Peter is talking about Jesus. God raised him up again. Talking about Jesus. Putting an end to the agony of death. Since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. I don't know if you've seen that phrase before. It was impossible for Jesus to be held in its power. This is the power that Jesus has. The power of his life. It was impossible for death to hold Jesus in its power. What, what you know? Why was that? Why was it that Jesus could not that could not be held by death in its power? We're told what what the power of death is. If you uh, a quick verse, I want you to see in First Corinthians fifteen, verse uh, fifty six. First Corinthians 15 verse 56, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. So the reason Jesus could not be held by the power of death is because there was no sin in him. He had been set, he, he, not set free from sin. He had no sin in him. He had overcome all sin. Every temptation that he had faced, he had overcome. And because sin had no power over him, death could have no power over him. It was impossible for him to be held by its power. And that has become a challenge for me, dear brothers and sisters, the life that I long for. I say, Lord, you had this life and you've called me to be a descendant of yours, to have the same power. We're not physically related to Jesus. I don't think any of us is. Well, uh, if, if anything, it could be through Mary or one of his other brothers. Jesus never had any descendants, but we are descended. We are related to him in the same power. It's a relationship of the same power. What power? So if, the, if it was impossible for Jesus to be held because of the power that he had in his life, it ought to be impossible for me to be held e either. It should be the same for me as well. That's how I know I have the same power. What does that mean? That Lord, you who kept Jesus from falling into sin, you who kept him from falling, preserved him day after day, week after week, month after month for his entire life. If you could keep Jesus from falling, Father, you can keep me from falling as well. And it ought to be said of me. See, it ought to be said of me as well. It is impossible for me to be held by the power of sin. I can't, I don't know if I can say that yet. I'm not trying to say that you should be brash or arrogant about it. But that is my ambition. That's the top of the mountain. That it is impossible for me to be held by the power of any sin. Is that your goal? It is impossible. For you to be held by the power of any sin. That is our goal. That's what Jesus had. And if you're pressing on on this goal. Pressing on to perfection. Say Lord. I want it to be true a little bit more. That it is less possible for me to be held by sin. Because I've been conformed more into your image. Then we're becoming more like Jesus. This is the attitude that Jesus had. This is the power that he had. This is what proved that he had the life of God in him. And we're told in scripture over and over again that we are to be, we're partakers of his divine nature. But this is an insight. And, and um, like we saw in that verse in Proverbs 21, that God is going to weigh the motives, the attitudes. I want, to, I want you to think about with me for a few moments before I close some attitudes that are critical, that God's going to judge. You might think, well, God's going to judge me when whether I, fell into this sin or that sin. Yes, that's also true. But long before that, if you're interested in what's on the inside, and I believe if we can check these attitudes, it will set us free from a lot of the outward sins that you're defeated by. Because if you think about it, the outward sins, if you strip it down, those actions of anger, murder, let's say, come from words of anger, you can say, which comes from, a th from thoughts of anger, which comes from motives and attitudes inside that result in anger. Jesus said, it's not what goes into the body that corrupts a man, but what comes out of it. And from the heart come murders, fornications, adulteries. So you, what you want to do is dig all the way down to see why, what, what was deep down in my attitude that caused me to say that word to my wife or to speak to her in a rude way or to go on the computer and watch that filthy thing. 
What was it in here, deep down in my attitude, that resulted in a thought process in words and in actions, ultimately? If you're just worried about the action, the fact that you, that you slipped up in that situation and got angry at your wife, that's like just slipping the bad fruit from the tree. And Jesus said the new covenant is about laying the axe to the root. Do you know that verse? Matthew chapter 3. When Jesus came inaugurating the new covenant, before that, John was explaining what this life would be like. And he says in Matthew chapter 3, the contrast, you can will, you can say, it's not actually said here, but the contrast between snipping off bad fruit whenever it shows up on the tree, that's the old covenant life. Make sure nobody sees it. Oh, cut off all the bad fruit. Make it look nice. Like everything's good. And then you're always worried. Oh, it looks like another bad fruit's coming out. Let me cut it off. Oh, it's been there for two days. Let me cut it off before somebody sees it. This is the old covenant life. You're snipping the bad fruit on the outside. And then Jesus came and John said, the ministry of Jesus will be like this. It will be, verse 10, like an axe laid to the root of the tree. So what does it mean to lay an axe to the root of the tree? That means go and look at your attitudes long before you find you, you've fallen into sin and you're mourning over that sin that you fell into. Say, Lord, I really want to be freed from that. Where is the root of this tree? Yeah, I know the bad fruit came out and I can cut off that fruit and I want to make sure I never do it again, but I want to get to the root of the tree. Where is that? And I want to show you a few things that are indicative of the root of the tree. It's another picture for this inside of the pencil. And the third, first is, be thankful. Have an attitude, or like they say, it's, it rhymes so it's easy to remember, an attitude of gratitude. That easy to remember, an attitude of gratitude. In all things, be thankful. I have found that unthankfulness often results in sin in all kinds of other areas. There's some root of ungratefulness. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, we read in verse 15. See, there's a difference between saying thank you and being thankful. You can teach your kids to say thank you, but they may not be thankful. And you could be thankful and may forget to say thank you. Right? As long as you're thankful, that's okay. Now, it's good to still say thank you. You must have both. Be thankful and say it. But when the kids are young, you can teach them. Just say thankful, but be, say thank you. But why are we teaching our kids to say thank you? What we want to teach them is not, okay, make sure you say thank you because you want people to think that you're thankful. No, that's the fruit. Put some plastic thank you fruit. No, that's not it. Be thankful. That's what we'll read here. We're trying to teach our children the fruit of thankfulness, of saying thank you, by having an attitude of thankfulness. Long for this, brothers and sisters. I tell you, husbands, if you are truly thankful for your wives, you'll find that all those words that come out in those squabbles are addressed because you've dealt with the root of thankfulness for your wife. You've dealt with the root of thankfulness for your husband. Teach your children to be thankful for every little thing that you do for them and you'll find rebellion is, out, is taken out of the picture. Colossians, 5, verse, Colossians 3, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Be thankful. He doesn't say give thanks. Yes, there are other commands in Scripture. Give thanks. He says be thankful. Verse 16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Now comes the singing with thankfulness. But it starts with being thankful. You know, there's a lot of people that sing their thankfulness to God on Sunday. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for loving me and all that. But you, they don't have the attitude of thankfulness during the week. You can see that by how they treat other people. It's a lack of gratitude. Thankfulness, singing with thankfulness comes after being thankful. And it's pointless. It's hypocrisy. If you're busy singing thankfulness to God on Sunday, but you're not thankful Monday through Saturday. That's why I say, let the meeting end, go home, be thankful, and then come back next Sunday and give your thanks to God. Then That's much better. Verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Be thankful. 
You know, there was a story in Luke 17 of um, 10 lepers, right? Children, you know the story of 10 lepers? Yep. How many lepers got healed? All of them, all 10 got healed. And what was the end of the story? Did, did anybody come back to say thank you? Only one did. The children know the story. And you know what Jesus says? Let's look at that verse very quickly. Luke 17. That 10th leper, that one leper who came back, got something that the other nine did not. Do you know what that was? He got salvation. He got salvation. All the others got healing. All 10 got healing. One got salvation. And that's the choice you and I have, brothers and sisters. Do you just want healing? Do you just want forgiveness from your sins? Or do you want salvation? Luke 17, the end of the story, after the ten lepers are healed. Um, this verse 18, this, this ten, the Samaritan comes back. Was there not ten cleansed? Verse 17, Luke 17, verse 17. But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner, this stranger? And Jesus said to him, stand up and go your way. Your faith has saved you. You see what the 10th leper got because of his gratitude? None of them did anything to deserve being healed. None of us has deserved anything to, done anything to deserve forgiveness. God just healed us. It's not like these 10 lepers did some special thing that God says, okay, I'll heal you. He gave all 10 of them the forgiveness and the, heal, uh, the healing. That's like saying he gives all of us forgiveness to, who need it, if we're willing to trust him. But the one who comes back, it says, thank you, Lord. I don't want to go so quickly away that I've forgotten to say thank you to you and thank you to somebody else. I hope before you leave this conference today or tomorrow, you'll say thank you to somebody who helped put together this. You saw somebody putting the chairs or picking up something. Say thank you to them. Not, not because you want to seem thankful. That's hypocrisy. Because you want the root, the attitude of thankfulness. And you will find... God will start to set you free from sins that have beset you. There's a salvation that can only come after you become a thankful person. And these are all things you can do today. You can be thankful today. You can start by saying, Lord, I want to be thankful today. Help me. You don't have to be a Christian for 20 years to be thankful. Just start today. I mean, your children are thankful. Why can't we? So be thankful. The second thing I want, to, want you to see in Luke chapter 6 verse 36, is be merciful. Have an attitude of mercy towards others. It's also something you can do right away. You don't have to wait 10 years to be merciful. You can be merciful right now. Luke 6, verse 36, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. And that means as many times and as often and as long, be merciful as your father is merciful. And that's, see, they we're talking about what does the inside of the pencil look like? If you look into Jesus, the, the, the inside Jesus, I think of it like a grape. You know, if you squeeze a grape, um, you squeeze it hard, what do you expect to pop out? You expect apple juice to come out? <laughs> no, you expect grape juice to come out. And when you squeeze Jesus, what came out? Mercy. When you are squeezed in a situation by somebody who wrongs you and speaks evil of you, or in a situation in, in a home between the husband and wife or with your children, and you're squeezed, what comes out? Is it a, I'm going to get you back? Or is it the silent treatment even? Is it a harsh word? Or is it mercy? Now, you can't fake it. You could try, but it won't last. If you're, if you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness, you say, Lord, I want mercy on the inside. Where you could wake me up in the middle of the night and squeeze me as hard as you want and mercy will come out. Mercy flows out from Jesus because his insides are mercy. So be merciful like your heavenly father is mercy. Do you want to know what the nature of God is like? Do you want to look deep inside? It's mercy. You know that um, it is a phrase that's used in James chapter 5. It's, a, it's picture language. Um, verse 11, James 5, verse 11. We count those blessed who endured. You've heard of the endurance of Job 
and have seen the end of the Lord. Uh, some translations say the outcome of the Lord's dealings, the end of the Lord's dealings. But the literal word there is, have you seen the end of the Lord? Now we know he has no end. He is the Alpha and the, and the Omega. But it's almost like James is saying, if you could see the end of the Lord. That's, what, that's why the story of Job is recorded. If you could see the end of God, what would you see at the end? That he is full of compassion and is merciful. What will people say at the end of your life? I wanted to, them to be able to say, not because I'm trying to impress them. Santosh was a merciful person. I want your wife to be able to testify. My husband, he's a merciful person. My wife, she's a merciful person. In order to be merciful, sometimes you have to be wrong. <laughs> you have to be taken advantage of somewhat. And if you allow the Lord to do that and say, Lord, I want to be merciful like you are. I want it so that at, a, at the spur of the moment, I'm caught off guard. If somebody comes and does something. What they find coming out of me is merciful. So be merciful. We're talking about what the inside of the pencil looks like. He said, be thankful, be merciful, be faithful. I want you to think about that, being faithful. Now, faithful, you can think, means, oh, there's a faithful brother. What does that mean? He usually means he does a lot of things. <laughs> and that's a false definition of faithfulness. Faithfulness doesn't mean that you are doing this, doing that, doing that other thing, doing that other thing. No, it doesn't even mean that you do everything that you said you would. That's an earthly definition of faithful. I think very simply, faithful means you're full of faith. Plain and simple. That means it has nothing to do with you. Faith is not about what you have. It's about who you're trusting. Are you full of trust in God? You're a faithful brother. You're a faithful sister. You may not do anything. You may not do much. You will do things if you're a truly faithful person, but you're full of trust in God. Most people tend to think of faithful people as those who can do this and do that other thing. Though that's gifted people. That's gifted people. Oh, somebody who does all these things, does so much for the church. He's a faithful brother. No, he's a gifted brother. And he's a servant, you can say. But I want to see somebody who's full of faith. Where they're squeezed and they're tested and they're tried. It could be a, a, a housewife at home with a difficult husband or if, uh, facing a situation in the home with a child or you're under a lot of pressure and in that pressure you find yourself leaning on God fully. Faithful. Be faithful. It's an attitude of heart. Um, that means that, you know, uh, I'll show you a verse in Luke 16. Jesus said that the one who is faithful will in little will be given much. Luke 16, verse 10. He who is faithful in a very little thing. So he's not talking about quantity. He's talking about an attitude where you're leaning on God. He who is leaning on God completely in a very little thing will also lean on God for a big thing in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been Again, I'm going to replace the word faithful with fully trusting in God, fully leaning on God. Okay, read it that way. Because that's really what faithfulness means. Faith is dependence on God. Faith is leaning on God. So verse 10, he who is fully leaning on God in a very little thing is fully leaning in God on God also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, verse 11, if you have not been fully leaning on God in the use of your money, who will entrust the true riches to you? And if, if you have not been fully leaning on God in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? You see that fully leaning on God even in the use of your money. So be faithful. Faithfulness is not, okay, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, I'm going to set a goal and I'm going to accomplish it. A lot of people think that's faithfulness. No, that's just meeting, setting your goals. Faithfulness is, Lord, I'm going to lean on you for whatever you put in front of me today. It could be a little task. It could be a big task. But whatever I'm doing, I'm going to be leaning on you. Like we sing that song, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, that we might be found leaning on God. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, you know what he's looking for? Faith. He's going to look for those who are leaning on God. Those are the ones he's going to take home. So it doesn't matter what you do, what your calling in life is. It might seem like a small ministry. But whatever you're doing, if in doing so you're leaning on God helplessly, God is pleased with you. Without faith, 
Without leaning on him, it is impossible to please God. But the converse of that is if you're leaning on God, he is absolutely delighted with you. Leaning, be faithful. And the last thing, the last attitude is, if you turn with me to Luke 12, be ready. Be ready. Jesus is coming soon, very soon. It will come at a time when we don't expect it, but we should live in a way as if we're expecting it. That's what you see in, um, in Matthew 24 and here in Luke 12. Uh, Paul says to the Thessalonians, we're not unawares that, we should, that the day of the Lord should come as a thief in the night for us, but it will still come, but we'll be ready. He will come like a thief in the night, but we'll be ready for it. But we don't want to be caught off guard. Luke 12, verse 35. Be dressed in readiness. Be dressed in readiness. And keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. Whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You to be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. The Son of Man is coming at an hour that you... Now, it's true the world doesn't expect Him to come, but it's also true that you don't expect Him to come, but you're ready. See, that's the point of being ready, is that God doesn't have to tell you when I'm coming, I'm ready. It's like me saying, hey, I'm coming over your house tomorrow. The first thing you're going to ask me is, what time, Hunter? <laughs> is it going to be 2 o'clock in the morning? Because that changes the game completely. If you're coming at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I can be ready for that. But 2 o'clock in the morning? then that means that I got to be ready at two o'clock in the morning. And that's what Jesus was saying. I'm not going to tell you what day and hour I'm coming. I want you to be ready. Be, have an attitude of readiness. Then it doesn't matter when Jesus comes. He doesn't have to tell you, hey, I'm coming. Do you think that's what it'll be like? Jesus will say, hey guys, 10 minutes to clean up your act. I'll be there. No. What does it say here? Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door when he returns, when he comes and knocks. What does it mean to in order to immediately open the door when he comes and knocks? What do you expect Jesus to be like? You know, it says comes and knocks. Do you expect it to be a banging on the door? Jesus is banging on the door. Here I am, Santosh, I want to take you up to be with me, and I'm st he's standing there banging, 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 because I'm in the other room playing my computer game or doing something else. He's banging on the door. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? No. I really believe this is what the coming of Jesus will be like. Gone. Did you hear it? A very light knock on here. And if you're not ready, if you're not listening for that, amid the noise of everything else that's going on in the world and in Christendom, if you're not listening for the, the light knock, you'll miss it. And you, Jesus will be gone. Blessed are the ones who are waiting. And so that they hear the knock, they're like, Jesus, yeah, I was waiting for you. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to just sit here and be like monks waiting for Jesus to come. No, we have jobs to do. We have families to raise. We have um, things to do practically on this earth. But in our hearts, on the inside, I'm waiting for Jesus to come. I'm listening. There's nothing on this earth that's holding me down. My ear is at the door. Even if I'm physically somewhere else doing something, I'm listening at the door. That's all I'm listening for. Is Jesus coming? Is he, is he knocking yet? Is he knocking yet? Is he knocking yet? Be ready 24-7. And then when Jesus comes, you will open the door immediately. Be thankful. Be merciful. Be faithful. Be ready. Remember this, dear brothers and sisters. It's If you write it down, maybe... But more than writing it down, ask the Holy Spirit to show you what does it mean to have the inside cleaned. We speak about this often in the New Covenant, that we clean the inside of the cup. It's the inside that matters. It's what's inside the pencil that matters more than what the outside looks like. Let's pray. Let's spend a few minutes in prayer. We've heard a lot today, and it's easy for us to forget. It doesn't matter as much what you hear or what you remember 
of what I said or how much you remember of what I said, but that you remember what the Holy Spirit wants you to remember. And so make this simple prayer. These messages are recorded, so if there's something you want to hear again, you can, but there's a very simple prayer. Holy Spirit, there's something that you know that I need, that you know that I needed to hear today. Please help me to remember that. And if it helps, write it down. Write something down that the Holy Spirit wants you to remember. And you say, Holy Spirit, even if I forgot to write it down, will you remind me of these things when the time comes? When I'm in that moment of need, will you remind me of what it is that, I, that you wanted to speak to me today? Oh, Father, I pray that you'll keep us in humility, that we'll be thankful, that we'll be, um, we'll be grateful to you, Lord, for all that you've done. We'll be merciful to others and we'll be ready for your coming. And we'll be faithful in everything that you ask us to do, leaning on you until you return. Help us, Lord Jesus, I pray for every brother, sister, child. Oh, I pray that your Holy Spirit will come and fill us afresh this evening, Lord, as we sit here longing for you, longing to see you more clearly, longing to experience this life that you want to give us more and more. Oh, I pray that you'll fill us. Fill me, Lord. Fill each brother, sister, child, anyone that's hungry here. Fill them. Fill us with your Spirit. And give us that anointing, give us that life, give us that authority over Satan and authority over circumstances in our life that you want us to have. I believe you'll do that and I thank you again that you've given us this day together. Be with us tonight and help us, Lord, to walk in soberness and readiness that you might call any one of us home at any moment. Thank you. Thank you that you're on our side against the devil. You're on our side to help us. We don't have to be afraid, Lord. You, All of this, this life that we've heard about, you've... You're ready to give it to us if we will humble ourselves and receive it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.